you have your Bible, open them to uh, Psalms chapter 31. Psalms chapter 31. I enjoyed preaching this in the first service. I hope you enjoy me preaching it in the second service. But it's a, it's a psalm that was written by David um, in kind of a, a, a very, very dark time. Some people have, a, uh, some Bible students have, have questioned what circumstance was going on in David's life to make him want to write this song. Because that's what it is, it's a song. And songs come from the heart. So this is a time when, and this is how David, I guess you could say sometimes, it's how he would um, learn to relate to things, to the circumstances he was going through in life. And uh, there was a lot of circumstances that uh, we could possibly look at what was going on in David's life that would make him want to write this song. But I believe it's about uh, when he had an issue with his son named Absalom. Absalom was a, a unique son. He was one of uh, David's first children, and he was a, a big, you know, David was not the tallest of guys, but Absalom was a big, tall, strong, good-looking, had this huge head of hair. As a matter of fact, <clears throat> he is very much known for his head of hair that he had, and he was uh, very well-liked, very well thought of. Uh, the, everyone just kind of looked up to him. We would say he was a natural leader. And, and David had to be so very proud of him. Though they had issues, it, that may be news to you, but sometimes fathers and sons could have issues. And, and David and, and Absalom had issues. As a matter of fact, there was a time when they would, could not see each other, and Absalom wanted to see his dad again, and uh, they thought that that relationship was put back together. But then Absalom led an insurrection for the a coup, so to speak, and wanted his father to no longer become be king so that he himself could be king. And he plotted against his dad. And he had this plan in place. But here's the thing about this. Absalom's plan could only succeed if David was dead. Not only David, but his other family was dead as well. Absalom wanted to be king, and he wanted no other rivals. And now he saw his dad as being in the way of him getting what he felt like he rightly deserved. Matter of fact, this had been brewing in Absalom's heart for quite some time. If you look back in David's life, and I never have enjoyed looking in, at someone's failures in their life and, and judging them by their failures. Y'all agree? Too often we want to look at someone's life and we want to find their worst day, and we've all got them, and judge them by that worst day. Hopefully my life means more than that. Ho hopefully my life can, you know, I, I praise God that with Jesus Christ, my Savior and my Lord, that he came in to make my worst day my best day, and only God can do that. And if you know, if you know, if you've been through some things, you kind of know what I'm talking about, and you experience those things. How the darkest of times can be the times where the light of Christ can shine through the greatest. But in David's life, it goes back to a time when he was much younger. He was successful. He had he had been faithful to God when Saul wanted to kill him. He was faithful. He would not lay his hand against the one who claimed as, as an enemy to David, King Saul. And he was faithful and had never lost a battle. He had led the children of Israel against the armies of the countries around them and been victorious every time. He was well thought of. Everybody loved him. He was the man after God's heart, the friend of God, the great leader king. And in that time, David, like probably most of us, wanted to kind of take a step back and enjoy the fruits of his life, the fruits of his labor. You know, he didn't want it every day to uh, be drudgery. He had fought the battles. He had led the army. But maybe he thought to himself, you know, it's okay for the army to go out 
without me. You know, I've got Joab and the other leaders there. They can do that. But that step away from being used of God was a wrong step. The first step that led to many steps of sin. And one day he was in his home, bored, taking a walk about on the flat roof of his home in the cool of the evening. And temptation came in a moment. You know, temptation comes to all of us. We need to be very careful because it, it aims small, but temptation wants to hit big. And in a moment, he began a journey down a road that he would always regret. In a moment, he saw a woman bathing, and lust was born in his heart, and disregard for that which was right, disregard for the, the thoughts of, of this woman, and he sent for her to be brought to him because he was king. And he felt like he could have whatever his heart desired. And Bathsheba came and he was with her. An adulterous relationship that David did not seem to care about if she was married or not. All he cared about was what he wanted. And it was fulfilled in a moment. And a child was conceived. And a cover-up was planned. To cover his sin. You see, we all sin. All of us sin in the quiet. All of us sin when we don't think anybody can see and anybody else would know. But God knows. And God lets those things that are committed in, in the private areas of our life be broadcast for all to see. And we would be ashamed if we knew what others knew about us. But yet God knows, and he's the one that we should care about most. So a cover-up was planned, and it didn't work well, and it ended up costing the life. David had a loyal subject, Uriah, murdered to cover up his sin, and he lost the child, and he lost the loyalty of many who served him in his armies, and his friends, when this became known, now didn't look to him with honor like they did before. And probably the greatest pain was the pain that it caused his family. For his children and those around him in his own home to see such disregard by their dad. And truly that's how Absalom felt. The betrayal that Absalom felt that David and his love for his mom and how that was broken and another woman was brought into their home, married quickly, part of the cover-up. But the seed of that sin found soul in Absalom's heart. And it didn't happen that day. But unrest began to take fold in Absalom's life and after a time when David and Absalom were not together where their relationship was broken over other reasons Absalom began his coup began his deceptive leadership to get other people to to follow him rather than to follow King David and it came to the point when when the when the plot came to fruition and, and, and the, the coup came in and David would be taken captive and David would be murdered. David's family would be murdered because they were also seen as one who could bring harm to Absalom in his plot. And his leaders, those people that were loyal to him, they had to flee for their life. Could you imagine the pain of his heart? Could you imagine the pain of not just a broken relationship, but, but really to know that it was his sin that not only had affected him, but affected his family and affected all of Israel. And from that, where do you go 
when you feel like you have nowhere else to go? Where do you go to find peace to soothe? Where do you go to find light when everything seems so dark? David went to be with the Lord. He leaves Jerusalem. And somewhere in here, David begins in his heart to sing thoughts of praise unto God for who God is and what he's done. If you have your Bible, let's begin reading in verse 1 of Psalms 31. Look what God's Word says. And you, O Lord, I put my trust. Those are such easy words to say. Lord, I trust you. I trust you. How many of you today can say that? You trust in the Lord. Amen? I mean, all over the building. I trust in the Lord. I know he can. I trust in him. Really? I mean, it's easy to say that in here, isn't it? Are you worried something bad's going to happen while you're in here? Now, I know you've got things that are happening in the world, but we come to this little oasis here when we meet together and we sing God his praises and and, and we want to just kind of escape those a little bit. And we say, yes, I trust in the Lord, but in the throes of the circumstances, when your heart is breaking, do you trust him then? David has nowhere else to turn. So he's looking and he understands and he says, this I know. I can't just say it. I I call it like a Sunday school answer. It's so easy to say. But now he's saying, Lord, because I know it's true, but Lord, because it must be true. You're God. I must trust in you. And he says, let me never be ashamed. Here's the thing. There's a lot of stuff about this book that we claim that we know and believe and and we live, but in the darkest of circumstances, do we really trust him or are we ashamed of it? Do we really know that it's right and real? Well, the evidence will be in how you walk it out. David said, Lord, I need help. Deliver me. But don't deliver me because I'm the king. Don't deliver me because uh, I'm the one who wrote Psalms. Don't deliver me because Samuel came and put his hands upon me. Don't deliver me because of any good that I've done in battle, that I slayed Goliath. Don't do anything because of my goodness. I believe he probably felt like you and I feel when we're going through the hardships of life. All of my goodness is filthy rags. He says, deliver me in your righteousness. Lord, if I stand in what I deserve, it's going to be bad, Lord. But, but would you come to me, not in who I am, but in who you are? Lord, I need grace. Bestow your hand of blessing upon me. Lord, I need mercy. Don't give me what I deserve. I deserve punishment. But Lord, bring me more than that so I can sing your praises. Look what he says in verse 2. Bow down your ear to me from the, from the highest glories of the throne in heaven. Hear my humble prayer. Know my heart. Know my need, O God. Deliver me speedily. How many of y'all prayed that? Lord, help and do it quick. Is uh, God as fast as you want him to be sometimes? How many of you know God answers? How many of you know God's right on time? Does it always feel that way? No. No. I know that he's never late, but don't you wish every now and again he could hurry it up just a little bit? Because in the midst of our circumstances, we're looking at it and we're saying, no, 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 no. You you don't understand. There's things that are happening. This is on a timetable. We need you to come through now. Could you imagine that? Us telling the God of the universe who is not held by time, right? What he needs to do and how fast he needs to do it. Aren't you grateful he never rushes? But David, as he's fleeing the city, fleeing for his life, he says, be my rock of refuge. Yet in that day, they would go and they would, in that countryside, they would find the, the high ground and they would find the high rock because it was a place that they could defend themselves better. He says, I, I go to that place, but Lord, not just physically, 
you're my rock. He said, be my rock of refuge, a fortress of defense to save me. You are my rock and my fortress. Therefore, for your name's sake, lead me, guide me. Then he says in verse 4, pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me. Can you say, Lord, my son, my beautiful son Absalom's put this trap before me. And he's got all these people a part of his plan. And Lord, it looks like they're going to win. Don't be dispelled when it looks bad. Don't lose hope when it looks dark. Don't, don't judge beforehand what God is doing. He says, pull me out of the net which they have secretly laid for me, for you are my strength. Lord, when I have no strength, you're my strength. Remember when he fought Goliath? He said, I don't come with all the, the, the armors of this world, but I come in the name of the one. Amen. Verse 5, I think, is so intriguing. When you look at Psalms 31, it is quoted by Jonah, it is quoted Jeremiah, but it is also quoted by Jesus. Look what verse 5. Into your hands I commit my spirit. You have redeemed me, O Lord, God of truth. Into your hands I commit my spirit. There is a, a lot of questions today about even how a person is supposed to be saved to come to know the Lord. And some people are saying you have to do it this way and some people are saying you've got to do it this other way. And there's probably, I can see how they're straining over this and how this side is probably accepting more than, than God would accept. But let me just tell you, the Word of God says, whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord... Y'all know the word of God, don't you? Y'all know what word. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That means we come to that place in time where we look to God as, as our help and our need, and we, we commit our spirit unto him. When I was 10 years old and I felt like my chest was going to explode, I knew I had sinned and I knew that God judges sin. But I also knew that God in his mercy, by the power of the blood of Christ, he redeems sin. He forgives sin. And I came to him and I said, God, under your hands I give my life. Under your hands I give my sin. All of my life I give to you. It's really not the magical in the words. It's a thing of your heart. And at the end of Jesus' life, when he was on the cross, he was saying the same thing. Lord, all the sins of all of mankind have come upon me, but under your hands I commend my spirit. Where else are we going to go? In the hardship of circumstances, where else are we going to go? When everything looks dark and bleak, where else are we going to go? Where else are we going to find strength to help in time of need? He says, Lord, into your hands. Into your hands. He says, you have redeemed me. That word normally when we think about it, we think of redeem meaning to buy back. But here it means to buy back with power. God just doesn't come through. God comes through with power. Now look at what Jonah quoted in verse number six. I have hated those who regard useless idols. David is looking at, at, at the, the, the life that, that Absalom is striving not for what is right, but for what his hand could achieve and hold to. He, want, he said, this is what I want. Jonah, when he looked at it, was thinking about what God had called him to do. Jonah, if you remember, was a prophet. Sometimes we give Jonah a bad rap, but never forget, he was a God-called prophet. And God sent him on mission. I want you to go and preach repentance to the people of Nineveh. The Ninevites, God loved too. And it doesn't matter how dastardly they were. It doesn't matter 
how ugly their ways were. It doesn't matter how conniving their government was. It doesn't matter all the plots and the plans that they had. God loved them too. The problem was Jonah didn't love them. Jonah wanted God to judge them. But God wanted to love and forgive them. By the way, how many of y'all know it doesn't do any good to run from God? I mean, old brother Jonah, he's got a testimony, doesn't he? Yeah, I thought I could get away from God. I was going to sail as far away as I could from him. But you know, trouble came, storms of life came. I was thrown over the side of a ship. He, he could literally say it. They threw me overboard. And in the time of deepest despair, despairing even for life, isn't it funny how God can find you right there in those places? And after God found a repentant heart, God, guess what happened? I guess Jonah was ready to be used by God. Never forget this. The greatest revival in the Old Testament came through the life of of a repentant, broken-down prophet by the name of Jonah. All the people of Nineveh, can I say it again? That's a revival. All the people repented. Is that something we need today? Is that something we're looking for and trusting in today? Jonah said, I have hated how they have trusted and regarded useless idols. But he says, I trust in the Lord. I will be glad and rejoice in your mercy, for you have considered my trouble. You have known my soul in adversity and have not shut me up into the hands of the enemy. You have set my feet in a wide place, in a big room. Literally, he says, you have set my free feet in liberty. It may look like Absalom and his armies are coming. It may look like my trusted friend, Ephibosheth, is coming against me. But understand this. I'm trusting in you, God. This has been a tough week for many people. People have had tough reactions to it. And they have questioned all these different things. But I'm telling you, what the church needs to do in 2020 is the church needs to look for the revival that comes from God. We don't need to put our trust in anybody else, anything else. We need to put our trust in God. And I've never known a time more prime for the revival of God's people than the time we're living in right now. Have mercy upon me, O Lord. Can I say as pastor, have mercy upon New Holland. Have mercy upon Gainesville. Have mercy upon our country. Have mercy upon all, not just the ones that we want. But Lord, all of us deserve the darkness of sin that has brought us. And the, when, we, when we've sown seeds of sin, as David could feel, we all should reap the processes of that. But oh God, give us more. Give us more. I'm going to read in verse 9 on it. And if you would, stay with me because there's one word I want us to catch from this. Listen to these words of Scripture and, and hear, what, hear David's soul as he shares these. Have mercy upon me, O Lord, for I am in trouble. My eyes waste away with grief. Can you see the tears? Yes, my soul and my body for my life is spent with grief, my years with sighing, my strength fails because of my iniquity, my bones waste away. I am a reproach among all my enemies, and especially among my neighbors, and am repulsive to my acquaintances. Those who see me outside flee from me. I am forgotten like a, a dead man, out of mind. I'm like a broken vessel. For I hear the slander of many. Fear is on every side. They take counsel together against me. They scheme to take away my life. There's some dark circumstances there. My, my wife reminded me after the first service. I, I said in the first service, I really don't care what you're going through. 
She said, Brian, you do. Can I say, yes, I do. But I don't regard your circumstances alone. I looked at your circumstances. I look at my own circumstances against the backdrop of the grace of the good God that he is. Everything looks bleak in the circumstances. His heart was breaking. His tears flowed down his face. He said, I'm like a broken vessel. It's falling apart. My countrymen have left me. Those around me, all is so bleak and is so dark. And it's because of my iniquity. Church, listen to me. David is now feeling the oppression of shame. Do you ever think back upon the times in your life where you failed? I'll raise both hands. I can't understand this, and I know the Word of God, folks. I know what God says, but there are times that I go back and I think upon the times that I made those mistakes, and I say, how could I? Why would I? You know, do you often think of those more than you think of the successes? It's my fault. I knew better. But let me tell you plainly, there is no place for shame in the recovery with God. Repentance, yes. Shame, no. Tell me one good thing that comes from shame. God doesn't believe shame is good. God dismisses it. God comes with love. God's desire is not to beat us down, but to lift us up. God wants your sin to be separated as far as the east is from the west. That's the way God looks at it. You're reminding yourself over and over of all of the times that you've messed up and you've broken. And let's, let me tell you plainly, with years it gets worse. We look back and we say, this is the effect of what I did then. This is the Niagara Falls that flows from that spring that I created years ago. David was probably saying, Lord, if I had turned, when I was on my roof that night and temptation came by and my eyes saw Bathsheba, what if I just said no and I turned and walked away? What if I had entered the room of my wife downstairs and, and enjoyed the pleasures of being with her rather than the adulterous affair? But the shame highlights the darkness. But God's grace highlights the life. Do you want to be Christ-like? Then look at your sin the way God does. Look at it and repent of it. Turn from it. And as best you can, never do it again. I understand like the song that we sang this morning. Prone to wander, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the one I love. We've all been there. We've all walked that, plague, that place. But don't live in the darkness of making a mistake. Live in the light of his love. And don't judge anyone else by their failures. Encourage them. In the same way God has encouraged you. He's going to say it for the third time here in verse number 14. But as for me, I'm trusting in the Lord. Not just saying it, I'm walking it out. You are my God. Personal relationship with the Almighty. My times are in your hand. He's walking it out. Lord, if you want me to die at the hands of Absalom, praise be to the Father. Whatever are happening, Lord, my day is yours. 
He says plainly, though, verse 15, deliver me from the hands of my enemy, from those who persecute me. Make your face shine, your face shine on your servant. Save me for your mercy's sake. Do not let me be ashamed, O Lord, for I have called upon you. Let the wicked be ashamed. Let them be silent in the grave. Let the lying lips be put to silence, which speak insolent things proudly and contentiously against the righteous. We listen to the noise, but Lord, come through. Verse 19 is so marvelous. How great is your goodness which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you. God has prepared good for us. Does that not sound like Jeremiah 29, 11? I know the plans that I have for you, plans for good, not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. He says, which you have laid up for those who fear you, which you have prepared for those who trust in you, in the presence of the sons of men. You shall hide them in the secret place of your presence. From the plot of man, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. Instead of worrying about all the difficulties of the circumstance, there's a place that we can go. We have a hiding place. We have a place of refuge. We have a place where we can find peace. We, can have, we have a place where the storms can be quieted. We have a place where the light from the throne and glory can shine in. We can have a place where the balm of Gilead can heal our soul. We can have a place where things that seem upside down can be made right again. I know of no place so wonderful and so good so powerful and so restful is the presence of God. Just to come into his presence. Come into his presence with singing. That's what David is doing here. Singing of the goodness of God. By the way, there's a phrase there in, at the end of verse 20. He says, you shall keep them secretly in a pavilion from the strife of tongues. John chapter 6 tells us, Verse 31 and verse 32, when people lie against you, when people who misunderstand speak things against you, do not speak back in return. When they came against Jesus, he never said a word because he knew God was going to make it all right. And by the way, God did. Find peace. Can I remind you of this? As powerful and as hard as the cross was, Jesus faced it in the power of God because the night before, he was in the Garden of Gethsemane finding the strength that comes from God when his heart could be one with him. In the times of trouble, find your time with him. Verse 21. Blessed be the Lord, for he has shown me his marvelous kindness in a strong city. Verse 21 is a turn in the story. Absalom has found his end. Absalom wanted David dead so he could be king. God didn't want David dead. And it turned back around, and Absalom actually died. Now David is coming back to the city to fulfill what God called him to do, to be king a king of righteousness to lead his people well. And now he's coming back into the strong city, it says in verse 21. For I have said in my haste, I am cut off from before your eyes. Nevertheless, you heard the voice of my supplication when I cried to you. When you cried, you may not have felt like God heard, but I promise you God heard and God answers. God hears our prayer and he's an on-time God. Listen to verse 23. Oh, love the Lord, all you his saints. I believe this is the word of God for us. I believe this is God's word to, to speak to us in this dark and dismal time, a very confusing time. He is, saying, he is saying, love the Lord, all you his saints, for the Lord preserves the faithful. He fully repays the proud. Be of good courage. He shall strengthen your heart. 
All you who hope, all you who trust, all you who stand, all you who find your anchor in the Lord. The word anchor, it means to to be standing upon the rock, to be held to that, fastened to that. When the storms of life come, and by the way, they're coming. I feel like I'm in one hurricane right after the next. 2020, man, I cannot, the date that I, the one day in 2020 I'm looking forward to is December 31st. Amen. Let's get this thing over with. But the one thing I know for sure is the God who is the God of 2019 will be the God of 2020 and will definitely be the God of 2021. And I don't mean to end this on a sober note here, but listen, somber note. As bad as 2020 has been, it might just get worse. When you didn't think that you thought COVID was bad, something else may be coming. It may get a lot worse. It may get a lot worse for his church. It may get a lot worse for Christians who love the name of Christ. The liberties that we think that we take for granted so very much, they may be like David's. We may lose some of those liberties. But let me tell you, when the storms of life come, build your house on the rock. Because if you don't build your house on the rock, it will not stand. But as long as the Lord Jesus Christ, our Father God, Jehovah, is on the throne, I will put my trust in him. There's no shortcuts to trusting in the Lord. The only way you can learn to trust the Lord is by doing it. So God puts us in circumstances and wants us to do it. But I don't care how bleak, I don't care how hard. I I know I care that you're having to go through something, and I'm, I'm sorry that you're having to do it, but trust me when I say, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Greater is the God who holds us in his hand. And as long as he's on the throne, our hope is in him. Heads bowed, eyes closed. Father God, we love you. We praise you. We bless you. We need you. And Lord, no matter what life holds, no matter how dark. Lord, you've seen these things and you've allowed these things. Jeremiah, who quoted your scripture, because he saw all of the terrible things that were being done, was killed. John the Baptist, who was not afraid to speak the truth, even unto the government, was killed. Jesus, you yourself were taken. And Lord, you allowed them to crucify you on that cross. But Lord, that wasn't the end. It was just simply the beginning of new life in you. Father, thank you for the gift of Jesus. Thank you that everyone who repents of their sin, everyone who trusts in you, Everyone who believes and who commits their life to you, commits to give you their sins, to repent of their sins, to give their all unto you, to be a follower of Christ, to be a disciple, to do what you would have us to do. Lord, that you hear every prayer and you save every soul who prays those prayers. Father, make us one. Make us one in the heart of love. Lord, Scripture tells us that the world will know that we belong to you by how we love one another. Not by how we yell at our circumstances and speak evil of others, but how we love in Jesus' name. Lord, you've called us to this. Lord, may our days be about fulfilling it by your strength. Lord, no matter what the world throws, greater is he, greater you are, than all of those circumstances. 
Oh, Lord, once again, I say thank you for the blood that cleanses us and makes us whole in you and keeps us on the solid rock of Jesus Christ. Father, help us this day. Bless those that are listening, oh, Lord. Bless us as right now, even in this moment, we surrender our hearts and our lives afresh to you. Lord, because we have no other hope. In Jesus' name I pray.